Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. A faultless Fabio finishing one lap too early, a horrible lap one crash, and a few surprise performances. The Catalan Grand Prix provided us with, well, lots to discuss. In fact, well, every race this season has so far provided us with lots to discuss. Long may that continue. Um, but the recording date right now is Monday, the 6th of June. My name is Harry Benjamin. Joining me as ever is Crash Moto GP editor Pete McLaren and, of course, former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewin. Well, let's start, gents, at the very start because there's so much to talk about, but it all kicked off in uh, Term 1, Lap 1, uh, with Takanakagami, uh, Banyaya, Rins coming together. A big hit for Nakagami on the back of uh, Banyaya's uh, rear tyre. We should say he was taken to hospital for checks. He's been kept overnight for... Or, uh, uh, for monitoring, still being monitored, but the team have said he, he's doing okay. Uh, head's a little bit sore, as you can imagine, but Keith, that could have turned out to be uh, much worse than it was. It certainly could have done, and we can all pray, and, and thankfully, that it looks like Tacker's going to be okay. Um, racing incident, the stewards deemed it, and I agree, and I think most people will agree with that. Um, maybe not if you're Alex Rins, and we'll go into that in just a moment or two, but there were no... It wasn't like he was rushing up the inside of anybody. He didn't look out of control. He didn't look like he was gaining any real momentum into that turn one. But you've got to remember is from a rider's point of view, you are starting from your grid position from a dead stop start into turn one for the first time of the entire weekend. No one gets an opportunity to practice that start from that position during the weekend. There are no practice starts. Even if you come out the end of pit lane and gas it up straight out pit lane, you're doing 60 kilometers an hour down pit lane, gas it up you can't get across the track to get onto the racing line quickly because otherwise you'll be impeding riders coming down the front straight at 200 mile an hour so the fact is the first time any rider gets an opportunity is it's sight and feel that's all it is for these riders that just goes to show you how skillful they are they barrel down into turn one for the first time at that velocity with a full tank of fuel and have to get it all anchored up and fight for position this racetrack is about position as well. That turn one, two, three is really important to, to, to try and pick up any mistake that somebody else has made. The other point being is, is that it was deemed a, a racing incident by the stewards. Most people will have agreed with that. And it is a consistent thing we've seen with these first lap incidents over this year as well as others. But this year in particular, consistency is important in decision making. And it looks like the decision was consistent with what we've seen already this year. Rins was absolutely furious that's the third dnf he's had through crashes this one completely not his fault at all you can feel some sympathy for rins with the position he's in he's fighting for his position to find another ride to start with he hasn't got a job at the end of this year when suzuki disbanded at the end of the year so rins is in a very vulnerable position at the moment so you can imagine he wants to prove particularly at home on that racetrack he was really looking forward to a good weekend um and his teammate had a good weekend as it turns out probably the best ride of the weekend was mir on the Suzuki. So you can imagine how he feels. But the thing that seems strange to me, and, and I, you know, I was lucky enough to get a phone call this morning to, to clarify this to me, was that you can protest that decision. You know, the, the team could have protested it, could have looked at it and decided that, okay, we want more clarity. Talking of clarity, almost remarkably, and we've been banging this drum here on Crash for some time, there was clarity that came out of you. If you look on the Dorna website, they've actually uh, stumped up with a reason for why they came up with a decision. Now that's a bit of a first. I don't think we've, I don't think anybody's seen that yet. Something that we've been saying that what they, they issue a statement to say you've been penalised under rule X Y Z, but they never actually tell you exactly why you were penalised under that or or given a reasoning, their reasoning to come to that decision. This week they have, and I think that's a very that's a forward step, and I think they should do that every single time there's a penalty. There should be clarification of their viewpoint and how they came to that decision. Just makes it clear for everybody and you can understand it better from a team's perspective. Teams could have protested if they felt that wasn't the case. Instead, what happens? Social media. Let's all go rabbiting on about social media. You know, the fact was we do not know when you're sat at home with your keyboard, what's going on at the track. What annoys me is when people start bashing the keyboard. You know, you can't say this, you can't say that. We don't know what's going on. We don't know how Tacker's condition is and all the rest of it. They do know how Tacker's condition is. There are people on site stood outside the medical centre getting insider knowledge on what's going on. Some of the broadcasters there have access that we can't get because we're too far away from it. When you're on site, you're getting that kind of access. Even the press office can't get the kind of access that some people seem to be able to achieve at track side. 
So when your troll is banging away on his keyboard, um, annoying the hell out of us all, because they've got even less knowledge than, than, than people in the stands at the track, it kind of gets a bit out of control. If the team felt that it was a uh, wrong decision, uh, they had the opportunity within the rules to be able to protest that decision. But by the time the, the stewards have viewed all the overhead positions, which all can get replayed back to them, we might not even see them on TV. They've got so many angles. Dorna have got access to so much stuff. They can see whether anybody has gained an advantage, whether anybody's done anything a little bit stupid, and they can work out whether that is. And the fact is, Tacker doesn't have history for that. He's not a dangerous rider. You know, he's a he's the kind of guy that you would say, you know, does he does he make mistakes like that? You don't often see a mistake from Tacker like that. It was a first lap incident, in my view. What do you think? Crash.net. That's where you put all your in all your uh, little writings underneath. Give me a slamming for my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and and the key point wasn't it why there was no penalty was that Taka yes he made up loads of places so people a lot of people jumped to the conclusion of oh well he must have done something crazy into turn one but he made those places up in acceleration he didn't break super super late and that and that was the key point for the stewards wasn't it Keith of, of, of that explanation the passes were made exactly under that. acceleration not under braking. And that's why they said, you know, there was nothing crazy here. The extra dimension, of course, Keith, wasn't it, is that those two guys had tangled just a week earlier. And so, of course, that that just added to it. If it was different riders involved, and probably, of course, Banyaya, the innocent victim as well, had it not been those guys, it would have just maybe calmed things down a bit more. But you had two guys that were already not on, not on, not best friends, we might say. They tangle again. And, um, you know, well, two of them are injured. We hope not too badly, but Alex Rins' his wrist, well, they're both missing the test today. Banyar is back on track today, but obviously it's had a, a big knock to his uh, title hopes again. I mean, what is he now? 66 points down. So, um, yeah, bad, bad for all three could of them. Have been, could, have been, could have been a lot worse if Aleish hadn't miscalculated um, oh, his last lap, die. of course, oh. for Banyar. So, oh. um, yeah, Harry, Harry cringed and hold his face. I mean, Aleish Spargo, we, we, we label him as a bit of an emotional character anyway. Mate, I'd have been crying oh. on that one. That was just... We've seen it before. Ironically, ironically, the last time I can remember, or the first time I can remember that happening, actually, was Bruno, 2013. Was it 2013? or 2014, I think it must have been. Alex Rins, Moto3, thought he'd won the race on the on the Moto3 race. It was a really close race, a really good race. And he, he crossed the line, thought he'd won it, backed out the throttle, and everybody went whoo, straight past him. And uh, it wasn't the last lap. He'd miscalculated it. But Aleish, on this occasion... Ended up finishing fifth, which kind of blew your... Um, it was a real shame for you, Harry, because you got him right up there on your uh, sweepstakes. But the, the, the sad thing about it was, because of where his pit crew were, you, anybody watching this right now, anybody watching TV, have you ever done 200 miles an hour, is the first thing I'll ask you. On a motorbike, by the way. Um, if you're doing 100 miles an hour, and I don't recommend this at all, but if you're on a track bay or something, stick your head out the window and see what it feels like. And that's at 100 miles an hour. Do twice that speed on a motorbike with the amount of buffeting and moving around that's going on, a track that's a little bit slippy where your braking point is where it is and and and, you, and you're trying to read a pit board that's static with a whole, with 20 other pit boards are all hanging out at the same time because everybody's so close in racing nowadays. So you've got all these pit boards. It is ridiculously difficult to read a pit board. Obviously, you've got a dashboard you know, on your dash, but again, it's bloody busy on a motorbike. You know, you've got so many buttons and stuff to, to mess around with now compared with the old days. All we had to do was a clutch, brake, throttle, no problem. Just three things to think about. Nowadays, you've got so much more to think about as well. So when you're doing 200 plus mile an hour and trying to, and behind the screen as well, with the bike giving it a load of this, you see what the onboards are like with the shoulder cams and stuff. And it's all on the bloody move. And you're, you're trying to get the, out of the blur, you're trying to pick out, you know, three lines of information. And what Alash was doing was watching the scoreboard. There's a tower there. with, the, And he saw the countdown, and it had one on it, and he thought it was the last lap, but it goes to naught. So he thought it was one. He thought that, that he had that one lap to go, but then it goes to zero. You have zero laps to go because you're on the last lap. So he misinterpreted what the bloody the, the punter's board, if you like, the, the spectator's board was saying um, because his pit board was further down pit lane and he'd got a lot going on when he was supposed to be looking at that 
Well, that's what he said anyway, and I believe Aleish because he's not the kind of guy that, um, that, that that would lie in that manner just to cover his own backside. He's mortified, and you, you can't blame him. So he went from a, a really good second place. I mean, pole position. He set pole position with the track at 58 degrees centigrade. For God's sake, you can't – how slippery that racetrack is anyway. It's got – it's a low-grip track, 58 degrees of heat, and he sets pole position, the fastest ever motorcycle lap around there. I mean, Aleish was on – Riding on a cloud, the guy was looking so good for the for the win until Quattararo. You know, I think Quattararo might have just reached alien mm-hmm. status. <clears throat> yes, we'll come on to that though. Well, just on these these costly mistakes that have occurred, obviously that turn one incident, and then uh, Aleish. I mean, it, it would have been a surefire podium, of course, and it would have continued that podium run that him and Aprilia have been enjoying. We've had lots of questions come in as well on this, and, and some of them include, you know. Is this going to dent his confidence enough to suddenly perhaps lead to a bit of a downturn in performance? Or do you think, no, he'll leave it firmly behind him and move on and Aprilia will be right there next time around? He'll be right there. I think that will have fired him up. Yeah, he's emotional. Yeah, you know, it was a disaster because it was his own decision. <laughs> Any normal person beats themselves up more about their own mistakes than about other people that, that make mistakes for against them, in my view. I mean, certainly that's how I am. I mean, you you, you get more... You get more peed off with making your own mistakes than you do about others tripping you up perhaps so Aleish will will that will be behind him testing today you know on the same track so they've got you know back-to-back conditions and so on um Aprilia in a brilliant place Maverick Vinales he's found a bit of form you know equaled his best ride of the year during the course of the weekend as well even with a soft tire in the back you, you've got to wonder why would you do that <laughs> <laughs> why, would, why would the entire grid have have a, you know, go for medium and hards and, and, and good old Maverick thinks he's going to get away with 24 laps of um, soft rear tyre on a track that's notably, you know, degradation is quite high at Catalonia, even though it's a, a low grip track. You know, the right hand side of the tyre gets ripped in in last three corners. Um, so it's, I don't know. I mean, it was a good ride from Maverick. Um, and like I say, he equaled his best already, but. There were some, uh, there were some very good rides actually up and down the grid. Uh, Pete, question uh, on coming from uh, Grieve underscore on Instagram. Um, you mentioned uh, Peko Banya obviously and in, being involved in that uh, start incident and uh, being incredibly costly uh, once again. That word for his title hopes. Uh, Grieve asks, is Peko's title shot over after this race? Le Mans, Qatar, Portimao, and now today, it's too many non scores, non finishes. <laughs> It's not, it's not helping, is it? I mean, the, the one thing that Peko is, is sort of keeping in his mind and trying to keep focused on, if you, if you like, is that finish to last season. All of those points that he made up at the end of last year. But I mean, even even he's sort of shrugging his shoulders after that and going, you know, it's, it's 66 points. But, you know, he did make up, I think it was close to 70 or something in those in the, you know, the last third of last season. So he's, that's all he can focus on is that he's, you know, it is possible. Obviously, we're not at the halfway point yet, but it's another big blow, isn't it? And uh, we're just seeing Quattararo, that consistency. We're at the start of the season, all those different winners, all those different people on the podium. And now we've seen Quattararo at Mugello and Catalonia, the two tracks that he was actually pretty worried about. And he's come away with 45 out of 50 points. I mean, I mean, Keith has mentioned that, you know, he's, he's making his case for alien status. And I think, yeah, you know, these were the ones that he was worried about. So if you, you know, to be as strong as he has been, this is why we've seen him so happy on the podium in both these races. Okay, he didn't beat Banyaya in Mugello, but I mean, to fight those mm. Ducatis. That, I mean, that was a the kind of ride that a Rossi or Lorenzo produced in the past on that Yamaha, wasn't it? Taking the the, the fight to those those guys at that track. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's it's a tough task, isn't it, to to make up that ground now it's going to take mistakes from Quattararo and uh, you know from what we've seen in the past you don't you don't get many of those it, it, it's tough Bagna, Bagnaia as well Bagnaia as well that's a racetrack that he's not had great luck with I mean it's not worked out for him very well at uh, Catalonia in the past so he looked like he'd overcome that so to overcome it on that track and look like he was going to get a hat full of points and to be taken out on turn one it is a disaster for him. It might just not be his year, judging by the way the, the luck is flowing. Uh, and and before we come on to uh, the Fabio and, and his uh, win, just lastly, uh, coming in from, I mean, lots of questions about this. Uh, there was a, a coming back to Taka and, uh, and Taka Nakagami. A lot of riders, obviously we talked, spoke about Rins, even Joanne Zarco hitting out at uh, Taka Nakagami. Do you think, Keith, it, it's fair that the riders have, have really sort of ganged up against Nakagami in the way they have done since the incident? Look, nothing's fair. 
yeah, this this is not flower arranging. This is war at this time of the season. Everybody's out for themselves. You know, forget about all of that niceties around the paddock. Yeah, I'm sure that, you know, there are going to be personalities that clash a little bit. There are going to be situations that happen on track that are going to make, you know, tensions within the paddock. But, you know, my view is who cares? You know, forget about what Joe and Zarko has to say. Get on with your job. Takanakagami's fighting for his career of staying in MotoGP. We've talked about it so often. You know, there are going to be situations. I don't consider Takanaka's army to be, to be a dangerous rider. Is he still in a ride that maybe should be for somebody else? Probably, in my view. So Takanakagami is still fighting to the best of his ability to be one of the fastest riders out there. The Honda isn't an easy motorbike at the moment. So, you know, doing achieving anything on it. I mean, just look at Polis Bargro, where he is. You know, it... it it's not an easy motorbike to ride. You know, the, the, it was a mistake. It was a racing incident. The stewards feel that. I'm sure there'll be a majority of riders that feel it as well. They'll be tinged with the fact that, you know, you shouldn't go skittling, you know, people at turn one, but occasionally it does happen. And we've all been either a recipient of that kind of manoeuvre or been involved in doing it ourselves to other riders. Uh, nobody in racing hasn't overstepped the mark into turn one at some stage or another. They may have got away with it, but the ultimate is what happened with Taka. Hopefully he will make a full recovery. Um, he was very, very lucky. When that helmet went up behind the wheel of the Ducati and smacked itself under the seat of the Ducati, I mean, it is horrendous to watch. I mean, he is a very lucky man to have survived it. I don't think that's too strong a thing to say. I mean, I think that in those circumstances... He's been very, very fortunate. Um, you know, I, I, I won't bring up other incidents where we've had people that have been killed in, in such circumstances, but there have been ones where close attention to another person's motorbike is, uh, has created very serious injuries indeed. So get well soon, Tacker. Um, whether anybody's bothered about being ganged up on, nah. I mean, it's... I wouldn't say everybody's bulletproof, Maybe you won't read the social media for a week or two because, you know, social media, despite however strong you are, gets to your head. Um, you know, I've spoken with many a top rider who would publicly deny it under normal circumstances. But in this slightly enlightened age of mental health, um, you are hearing more riders that are saying how much trolls and, you know, campaigns, viral campaigns of hatred through Twitter, Facebook, whatever it might be does affect them you know it affects all of us you know there's there's not the the traps in place for for killing this stuff off i'm afraid it's what all of us have to contend with as broadcasters we all have to contend with it you know you know people either like you or they don't like you in some respects what you say how you say it how you look my favourite is still Grandad, I've got to tell you. That made me laugh out loud when I saw it. Uh, keep them coming. No, no, no. Who is that Grandad? I'm not a Grandad. I might just look like one. I've got lots of kids. But anyway, I mean, I can laugh about it because it, it's not that important to me. But when your life is absolutely dedicated to doing the best job you can do on all fronts, as these riders are, we're talking about the pinnacle of, of our sport, um, and you've got, you know, campaigns of keyboard warriors, you know, making snide comments from some pseudonym. You know, it's just annoying, unnecessary. You know, you can you can broaden it out to kids at school where bullying nowadays is not a physical thing. It's a cyber thing, you know, and so on and so forth. It's just our age. It's where we're living. But most people in professional sport will have a system in their head and in their entourage that counteracts that you know they'll, they'll ignore it they'll turn it off for a, for a while when they know they're going to get some some shit to be quite basic about it and they will turn it off so that it doesn't add to their own uh, feelings of where they are in this situation yeah i think uh, i think you right you say that very well keith and uh, i think it's worth saying actually you know if you are thinking about tweeting something or commenting something just just think twice before before you hit that send button if what you're actually saying is is worth saying to somebody um and if you're the recipient of it, take a yeah. holiday. You don't need Facebook for a week or two. Take a holiday. Do you know what surprises me? I came off Facebook years ago just because 
I can't be asked with the length of the replies you have to give because it's Twitter suits me fine. Two hundred eighty um, digits is is great for me. It's about the it's about my intellect, so I can manage two hundred eighty digits. Facebook, you have to be able to put things in paragraphs and stuff. You know, that's, and I came off Facebook, and I have to say, with a hand on heart, it's the best thing I ever did. I never felt like I needed it. I never felt like I missed it. And all the information I want is in press releases, is on Twitter, is in other formats that are much more reasonable and certainly mm. less intrusive. Um, and I don't want to see what somebody had for dinner last night or, or how a cow is killed to eat or whatever it might be that comes up on your timeline. You know, I'm not interested in that. So the, my word of advice is if you feel vulnerable, if you feel that there is, you know, this stuff is getting to you just a little bit, take a holiday. Just take all of that. Just ignore it for a little while. Perfect. I don't need telling twice. I still have Facebook just to update my uh, my aunt on what I'm doing. She doesn't use any other social media. Uh, but thank you, Keith, for uh, for the social media the social media rant. Uh, but I think it's it is worth saying. So yeah, just uh, just just have a think twice. And also worth reiterating that all our, our thoughts as well at crashed on it. I would sack an Akagami hoping for a speedy recovery for him. Uh, right. Those are the costly, costly errors uh, out the way. Uh, but a faultless ride from Fabio Quattararo. It seems off the back, of course, signing a, a new multi-year contract with Yamaha. Monster Energy as well, renewing their title sponsorship for Yamaha for the same length of time as well. I don't know if that's uh, slightly significant too. Uh, it seems that Yamaha in the hands of Fabio Quattararo are, are certainly uh, uh, going well. And, and well, he's he's trouncing his title rivals right now, isn't he? Quattararo is Yamaha's saviour at the moment. They recognise that. Monster recognise that. Monster aren't bloody daft. I mean, there are no coincidences in business. That is for certain. So you know that that tie-up was 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 meant to be. I think Yamaha haven't given Quattararo what he needs this year. If Lynn Jarvis is to be believed, and I've got no reason why that's not the case, you know, he was clear with Quattararo that they weren't going to be able to give him what he really needed, the horsepower that he needed this year. Now, if Quattararo understood that from the beginning of the year, then you can it suddenly all slots into place, doesn't it? We can kind of understand how that partnership has worked. Losing a satellite team is a is a is a strange thing for Yamaha, um, and it is going to be a costly thing for them as well. It still begs the question, you know, what are they going to do come twenty twenty three? Because there's going to be an almighty piece of poo that's going to go in the fan come testing if Yamaha haven't got some real upgrades that work. Um, they've obviously promised Quattararo the earth um, and they're going to have to stump up with it. If they don't come up with that, you know, 10 mile an hour, maybe it'll be 12 mile an hour by the time we get to the end of the year, you know, in the tests in Valencia, um, then that contract is going to seem like a long, long time of purgatory for the likes of Quattararo if he's always going to be down that kind of horsepower, 23, 24 and onwards. Um, so we'll see where it goes. But uh, Yamaha Yamaha are lucky to have someone like Quattararo. And hopefully, um, I believe that they will um, get it right. I mean, Yamaha is a fantastic manufacturer. They you know, they just seem to be a little on the back foot development-wise. Well, it's an interesting point, actually, that, Keith. And, and Pete, if I bring you in on this, I think uh, it's Luca um, Mamorini. I think that's how you say it, ex-Toyota and Ferrari F1 engine designer. I was reading uh, before the weekend had been brought in to consult with Yamaha to improve its MotoGP engine. He's already worked with Aprilia in MotoGP. So uh, to work on, on this engineering side and design side, it seems that, well... Yamaha are, are you know are listening and are, are trying to make the right moves to improve that. This seems to be that this engine pledge seems to have been what secured Quattararo's deal, shall we say, as, as Keith was explaining. Now the question you might ask is, what what took Yamaha so long to realise this? I mean, it seems like as Quattararo says that that they didn't accept until now that that top speed was the thing that they really needed. Well, I mean, he was explaining this, wasn't he, Quattararo, for the past year and a half or so. So. Yeah, it's, it, it seems like they finally have agreed with this, as in the Japanese engineering side agree that this is what they need from the bike. Um, and Quattraro admitted, you know, he was unsure. He was speaking to other people after the start to the year. Of course, he won it at Qatar last year. He had a bad start to this season and, and he's got the, the lack of top speed. He was starting to maybe wonder, should I should I stay here? And, and this was needed, I think, to really reassure him that, yes, you know, we're going to give you what you say, what you need. We're going to make that investment uh, on the engine side. And that's, uh, you know, they're going to bring a lot more people in. 
as Keith says, so the satellite project is going well. I, I guess you know maybe it's, they can focus all of their efforts more. I, I don't know, but but on the other hand, yeah, it's less data and everything else. But certainly, there's there's no excuses now in terms of Yamaha not turning up. Let's say at the start of next year, pre-season testing with you know a lot more engine power for Fabio. I think you're right, Pete. You just hit the nail on the head. I mean, losing the satellite team actually frees up quite a lot of cash. You know, and it's a situation where they can focus on that. This may have suited them. You know, we're in a, we keep talking about the world economic situation at the moment. Suzuki have dropped the ball like really quickly, um, even though they just signed a five year deal with Dorna to continue. So Suzuki's board has decided that this is, you know, it's got to be financial. It couldn't be any other reason because they're in the right position bike wise. You know, they'd signed a new deal with Dorna. So it had to be a, a boardroom decision over finances. Yamaha will be having the same argument with themselves. There'll be the racing department that's arguing with some other department and they'll sit around a big boardroom and, and make their mind up for their budget. So actually losing a team to, you know, four bikes effectively, which they were paying for, um, would be, you know, quite a cost saving. You remember at Yamaha back in the day, decisions have to be made this month in June regarding their strategics for development. You know, June was the cutoff Back in the days when uh, the RNF team, you know, Sepang International Circuit team as was, when bikes were being made for that team, I think it was the 26th of June, they needed a, a, a definitive at that point as to whether they were providing bikes for that team in the following year. That's how far lead-in time there is engineering-wise to actually stick this stuff together. You know, it's one-off prototype materials. It takes a long time to design, manufacture, get it all out there. So I think that uh, slightly surprised that, that the Aprilia connection that you made there, Ari, I mean, under normal circumstances, someone that would work for one manufacturer would be under some kind of um, contract to not be allowed to work for somebody else within a certain period of time. I mean, uh, you know, clearly, you know, Aprilia have made massive steps this year. So if somebody's got a, a head full of designs and ideas that they've tried out on Aprilia that have worked and then moved across the Yamaha, that would be quite a coup if that is, the, is, is an absolute fact. Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that develops over the next few months as well. I must keep an eye on Yeah, well, that, I mean, I, I saw that from uh, a from tech journalist Craig Scarborough, who's very well known in, in uh, the Formula One world and, and is uh, making a lot of uh, um, designs and, and uh, advances in MotoGP as well. And he was the one who, who put it out on Twitter. Um, so uh, I, I trust him. So, uh, But we'll have to monitor that one and see see where that one comes from. But I thought it was worth mentioning. Well, he is he is a trusted for You know, Scarves is a, a, yeah. a trusted source normally. He would, he's, he's quite a sharp No, absolutely. Fellow. So um, so I think I might be seeing him in a few weeks' time anyway, doing, doing God forbid, four wheels. So I'll, I'll see what more he knows. Um, questions. Lots of questions come in. Great to have you all uh, messaging us. Thank you for that. Um, Stephen Proctor has asked, uh, normally MotoGP champions have dominated Moto2, Moto3 and then move up. But we've seen Fabio and possibly in the future Enea Bastanini be a bit of an exception. Do you think there's riders in the lower classes now that would suit a Grand Prix uh, bike more than what they can currently show? And who do you think they are? Do you know what? That's a great question, Stephen. I've got to say that really is. And, and I, there are always those flickers, those glimmers you look at. Jaime Mir, when he was on a Moto3 bike, I think it was me and Hodgie back in the day, said he's a MotoGP rider. You could just see the way he was using a lot of rear brake and he was doing a lot of things that is a skill set that, that transcends Moto3 into MotoGP. And again, nowadays, they're all at it. You know, there's such a raft of super talented youngsters coming through. It's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because we've got the 18-year-old cutoff thing next year. And that's where nobody under 18 can can come into Moto3. So there are going to be a few of these riders that are, that are coming through as 16-year-olds at the minute that are, are actually, they've got ahead of the game there. They've, they've got an extra sort of um, jump. I wonder how much that's going to affect uh, the, the, the grid and the performances to some extent. As for picking them, I'm not going to do that. Um, that that really is a recipe for a, a, a bit of a disaster. But um, standouts, you, Acosta was a standout. You know, you know, he, he and he's started to come good now. We'll wait and see how he goes. What you got to remember is the jump from Moto Three to Moto Two is much bigger now than it used to be. It used to be Moto Three and Moto Two were quite close together. Then there was a big jump from Moto Two to Moto GP, performance-wise, technology-wise. 
But now that since the Triumphs have been on board, the electronics that are on board the Triumphs and so on and so forth, it's much closer to MotoGP. So Moto2 riders have, 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 are a little bit closer in, in performance and the technical knowledge and stuff like that that they need to go to MotoGP. But a jump from Moto3 straight to MotoGP, that's a massive jump. There are very few riders that are, are going to achieve that. You know, Jack Miller, when he did it, we all went, whoa, you know, that's a big old jump. And I think even he underestimated it. With the, 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 I'm going to say arrogance because I think that sportsmen need arrogance. They need to believe, you know, 100% in themselves at what they're doing. And I think that when Jack jumped to MotoGP, he naturally believed that he was going to be able to do it, but he wasn't physically quite fit enough. I don't think he got his brain quite in gear for a MotoGP bike at that stage. But he soon came up to speed. I think Jack Miller is is, is a lot smarter uh, man and rider than than sometimes people well, give Darren, him credit. Darren Binder. They just see the, the jet. Darren Binder. Yeah, that's a good that's a good shout. Darren Binder is looking really good. Yeah, that's thank you for the reminder, Harry. Yeah, I agree. I think Darren Binder is doing a great job. You know, and the Basher Binder, the you know dive bomb Binder, and all the tags that he had in Moto Three um, haven't translated to Moto GP. It shows his skill set is more than just the fact, the desperado that we would see on track in Moto3. I think most of his Moto3 accidents were really more to do with, with frustration than anything. You know, it's you're so close in the Moto3, you know, a millimetre close with everybody, and you're just trying to pinch that millimetre or two. And quite often the reason why you're, you're a millimetre behind is because there ain't no more room for breaking into a corner or whatever, and he always used to test the boundaries to the absolute limit. I think he's done a good job in MotoGP. Hats off to Darren Binder. He certainly has. It's so difficult, isn't it? Sorry, Harry. I just going to say, it's so difficult to pick, isn't it? I remember talking to David Brivio uh, you know, when he was a Suzuki team manager, and you know, this is the guy who basically brought in Vinales, Mia, as Keith was talking about then, and, and, and Rins to MotoGP, you know, this same question, you know, how do you, how do you pick the talents? And of course you can look at obvious stuff like gaps to their teammate, gaps to the other guys on the same bike. And, and Brivio was, was sort of talking about, can you, you know, almost come up with sort of statistics and look at statistics for the riders to kind of pick it. And he, he's quite into that kind of thing. And he said that he, he, he always tried, but it's it's just not that you just can't do it purely on numbers. You know, you can't do it purely with results. I mean, if you want to look uh, on, on Moto3 on Sunday, you had David Munoz, what was he, 20th on the grid to second in his second race. I mean, th- there's the kind of performance that is going to catch people's attention, isn't it? And, and make them think. The trouble is, as Keith explained, most GP bikes are so different to any other kind of bikes that you just don't know what someone's going to do until you put them on it. There used to be a time where Honda would invite, I think, the, the top, riders in motor in 125 i think it was then still 125 two strokes um to try out the motor gp bike at the valencia test you know sort of a, a reward for their their season and that was again always great because it was just putting riders on a motor gp bike and of course it was you know this is not serious that, but you know we put a rider on a motor gp bike they're going to try and do a lap time aren't they and it was always interesting to see you know how close they were these guys that were in theory just having a bit of a reward ride and everything else because you can never be sure we've seen it with fabio look at him what he's done on the bike but uh, yeah i mean if you could it's like picking picking horses isn't it or, or race winners you know if you could pick the talents of the future you'd be a very wealthy man certainly in terms of management fees and everything else wouldn't you um but it's it, you know because the ride is so important it's it is such a vital vital part of success in motor gp so you can bet the teams they all sit down and have big meetings over who is the next guy? Who is the next alien? As we keep pulled up that question that we should be looking out for because they don't want to miss out on them. You can have, you can spend all this money on the bikes and everything else. If you don't have that rider, you're not going to win. So yeah, it's a really difficult. And as I say, the obvious thing is, is you look at teammates, you look at other riders, but yeah, difficult until you put someone on the bike. I, I mean, I would, I think, as I say, the, the idea that the way that Honda used to put a lot of young riders on the bikes is a bit of a reward at the end of the year not a bad way to just see who who adapts to that kind of power and just get a bit bit more of an insight used to be a bit of a ratio that everyone worked to wouldn't there about how much money it cost you for an extra horsepower and then you get somebody like uh, quattararo i mean whatever they paid him it was cheap because he is outperforming that motorbike on lower horsepower to get the same advantage just out of horsepower <laughs> would cost them many many millions of pounds Interesting you mentioned Davide Brivio, who was at, on site at Catalonia. Davide Brivio, who went across to the Alpine Formula One team for a while, and uh, he's on his way back to the bike paddock by the look of it, to me. Um, is that significant, I wonder? The fact is we still haven't had a definitive 
press release from Suzuki. They're kind of ending the year, we've heard that, but those two slots are still there, the grid slots that Suzuki sit on. You know, I wonder what the game is behind the scenes regarding that. I mean, I don't know what you've heard, Pete, but I'm I'm not hearing anything. It's funny enough, I've got um, a dinner with um, a, a good friend of mine who's um, a top man in the hierarchy at MotoGP um, on Thursday. So I'll, I'll, I'll be trying to press him over red wine to uh, find out exactly where we are regarding those two slots and who might be taking them, who's guaranteed to be taken. I mean, obviously, we've got Aprilia that are coming in um, with their satellite team, but we've still not heard what's happening with Suzuki, really. You know, is there that possibility that Suzuki will stay? I think it's they've got to find this settlement, haven't they? This legal way of extracting themselves from this, well, the remaining four years of their contract. And, and, and as you say, Keith, might that involve perhaps a smooth handover of the team in some way to another factory? I mean, that might all be part of what these negotiations are about. Uh, you know, there is a, a world championship winning race team there. It's not going to stay together for long. You've got to say, you know, if they don't, if someone is interested, they need to act pretty quickly because the other teams are going to be picking out the key players otherwise, aren't they? They're going to be, you know, you know, if, if people are unsure of their future, they're vulnerable to, to being tempted away by other teams in the paddock, perhaps teams that they've even worked for before. So it's a small place, the paddock, isn't it? It's pretty easy to just walk a few doors down and say, any chance of a, a place next year? So if someone does want to keep the team together, if say Brivia would be, the, you know, an ideal guy to lead it, but you need the money, you need the money behind it, don't you? You need the factory to come in. I think as Brivia was saying, it's too early probably for 23, but a team could, let's say, start the process, maybe do a few wild cards, do some testing after races and enter in 24. That would be a realistic timescale for a new manufacturer, which it seems is what Dorna want for this place. And, you know, another factory, they don't want another independent team. So the, possible i mean is it wishful thinking could it happen well, well i mean there's, there's all uh, all interesting points for your dinner on thursday keith but uh yeah we'll, we'll find out next week i suppose <laughs> feel free to record that one uh, if it's all good uh, <laughs> just casually under the table uh all about board at crash.net um lots to discuss still uh we've got moto 2 and moto 3 to come uh still want to finish off the podium uh from moto gp we haven't even spoken about the two pramax on the podium now i may have lost my alicia spargo prediction but i did also have joanne zarco for the podium so swings and roundabouts uh, but jorge martin as well back on the podium after where well, his is well slightly improving run now but of course uh, so many DNFs in a row. Um, good to see those two battling out. Martin in second at one point, but Aleish looked to be playing the long game there. Nice tactical uh, manoeuvres by the looks of things from Aleish Spargro. But uh, Keith, what did you make of the two Pramax on the podium? Well, you're right about Aleish. I mean, the lap times he was putting in at the end of the race, he got mm. second place done. I mean, he, he was brilliant. I mean, he put in really, really quick laps in those last couple of laps, <laughs> although he was a bit premature in finishing his race, which was a great shame for him. But obviously launched Pram up into, into second and third places. So they were good rides. I mean, Zarco, tell me with Zarco, you can never really bet on him. I, don't, I never quite know what, what Joe and Zarco we're going to get each weekend. You know, it's, it's a very strange thing. He's a massively fast motorbike racer. He's a unique individual. There isn't anybody like him that I've ever come across anywhere in the paddock ever. You know, he's just an unusual character. So, you know, well done you for, for, for having the faith. Because um, I wouldn't have put any money really on him, but done. there you go. Yeah, how much I know. <laughs> I really should have done. Do you think? Do you think his his? We don't really talk about Zarco much in in the the rider manoeuvres that are going. Jorge Martin, of course, being spoken about loads, but it looks like he's sort of going. He's going to miss out on that factory Ducati seat, maybe to Anea Bastianini in the end. But we don't hear much about Zarco. Do you think he's safe in in that seat? So what is that situation in it? Because uh, you know when when the the weight of all the press that you're getting and the and the sort of you don't look to Zarco for the for the kind of result. You, you nobody's kind of looking in his direction at the moment. So his stock value is probably a little lower than it rea in reality should be. You know because he is a fantastic rider, and you kind of wonder whether he's going to break through a little bit. You know it's time. You just expect him to be a bit more there or thereabouts. I mean the Pramac bike is a good bike. The Pramac team is a good team. And would suit, I would think, Zarco's personality, a little bit more relaxed. You know, it's it's not quite as intense. I don't think Zarco um, copes as well with the intensity of a full-on factory expectation, if you like, whereas Pramac 
despite the fact they are factory bikes, the team itself is is a is a is a nicer place perhaps to be. Although you know Ducati is not not a bad team. It's just that you know when you are the full red factory team, there it comes with with the full on pressures that go with that. The expectation is is huge. Um, Don't know. Uh, Zarco is just one of them characters that is very difficult to fathom. Um, is he safe? I would say that no one is safe with the way that people are performing. Um, the only good thing about that is is the inconsistencies that you're seeing throughout the field, with the exception of one or two riders. You know, Bastianini, you know, has had brilliance. He's had more, you know, and he had more wins than anybody else, I think, still. He's had three wins. Um, so we're in a situation where Bastianini can't kind of nail down his consistency at the moment. He got no feel in the front end at Catalonia. Something that everybody complains of there. You know, it's a, it's a tricky track. It's got them nicely polished stones that probably need relaying. It's a track that's used a lot. So everything has had the edges knocked off of it. So grip levels are low. It's not an easy, you know, turn five is a nightmare on, a, on any bike. Not even, you know, I was going to say MotoGP bike, but turn five takes takes you out at least once during the course of the weekend. Downhill, you know, camber's a bit awkward, change of, uh, of, of weight, front to rear, rear to front. Um, so it is a it is a tricky track, um, and again, Zarco is in the ballpark. Boy can ride a motorbike, and I think Helby is chat- two French riders again up on the top. top, top. And actually, yeah, halfway through testing here on Monday, they're, they're one and two on the timesheet, so they've continued that into today. But I was going to say, helping Zarco's chances for next year is really as, as Keith called last week, Miller and KTM. I mean, that's that's going to take some pressure off off Zarco, isn't it? If they needed to find a place for Jack in the Pramac team. Zarka would have been the obvious one to make way, wouldn't he? So it looks like that the, the the KTM deal that Jack is going there, so that definitely helps Zarka's chances of, of staying where he is. Uh, as far as Jorge Martin, I mean, back on form, it seems like he went back to a, a standard fork setting or an earlier fork setting, and it gave him that front end confidence again that he's talked about. So important for riders, he got that back, and suddenly he's got the speed back now. He's, he's not testing today because he's having a hand operation. He's, he's had this nerve problem in his right hand. So he's not on track today. Um, you know, you might say after after Sunday's result, why would you go under surgery? But he's sure that it's something that he needs to get fixed. And obviously this is, we've got one weekend off now and then it's another two double headers. So there's not many chances during this season of, of 20 races to have some time off. So, so yeah, so he's not there today, but back on form, but does look like it's come too late for that factory Ducati ride. Must be playing him up a bit, otherwise he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have squeezed it in with two weeks because we've got a long old summer break now with Finland being gone as well. So I, I, I kind of, it must be more, slightly more to it. I think he might be playing it down a bit. He's decided to get it done, you know, as quick as he possibly can because um, there are more opportune moments this season to, to get an operation like that done if it's not that important, as he says. Well, we'll uh, have to uh, wait and see on that one. We'll bring you all the latest, of course, on Crash.net. Now, we are rapidly running out of time, but I want to squeeze in Moto2 and Moto3 because we didn't really uh, touch too much on that in uh, last week's show. Uh, And what a show they put on for us. Uh, Let's start with uh, Moto2 first. Um, Chelsea No Vietti won a duel that went all the way to the line with Aaron Canet to clinch victory in the Moto2 Catalan Grand Prix. Jake Dixon and Augusto Fernandez were battling over third P. Unfortunately, Dixon losing out on that one. And Joe Roberts crashing out from the lead. What did you make of all the Moto2 action, Pete? Uh, I mean, as you say there with Joe Roberts, what what a shame because he'd, you know, he'd made the break and he looked like he could he could keep the pace. You know, when someone makes an early break in Catalonia, we saw it actually with Quattro in the MotoGP race that follows, there's always that slight worry that they've gone a bit too soon and they're going to burn through their tyres. But, uh, uh, you know, and okay, it was only mid-race distance, but it did look like Joe had things under control and then Danny went. So, yeah, big blow to him. Potentially a second win this year, of course, after that that Portimao restart. So, yes, and then, as, as you say, another, and then a big battle for the for the remaining podium places and Jake just losing out on that last lap. But I think, you know, it was, it was a competitive performance by Jake and he'll be happy to be to be back up there. And Vietti, you know, uh, back on form, as we say, he really, he, he'd gone through a bit of a slump, hadn't he? And he was coming under pressure and he had some bad luck, okay, at his home race with the technical problem. But yeah, exactly the result he needed to sort of re- reinsert himself at the, uh, the head of the championship. Jake Dixon had um, quite a bit to say about Joe Roberts. He couldn't believe how quick he was pushing it. And he, he said he must have been right on the very edge. I remember him saying that. Jake Dixon suffered, because he was in a bloody slipstream situation he was around other riders he had a the front tire um increased in pressure quite considerably so he had a, a front tire that was feeling a bit uh, 
not quite where he wanted it to be um, most of the race. But the, the getting past for that third place, he'd have been annoyed about that. But it was kind of inevitable. You, you saw he was being lined up for it quite regularly. You know, the, the, the lap before it was almost done in the place where he got past. You know, it was it was unfortunate for Dixon, but it was another great consistent ride for him. And I think Dixon is is there. You know, he's 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 right on the cusp of, of, of great things. I think in Moto Two, he's relaxed, he's happy, he looks great on the bike, he's reading the bike really well in the circumstances. He wasn't tempted to do something stupid when he got past. You know, he he, he sat in and tried to make the most of what he got at the time. And I mean, that's what makes you know, a clever rider, somebody who's not going to throw it at the fence all of the time. You can't win championships. This is, again, you know, we go back to the Quattararo situation. Quattararo takes the points when he has to. And that's an important scenario when you're trying to win a championship. Conversely, on the other side, Sam Lowe's seems to be in a bit of a, a rut at the moment. In fact, David King has asked, with the consistency of inconsistency what do you think would be the best career choice for sam lowe's keep contending in the moto gp paddock or move to world superbikes sam will stay where he is as long as he can stay where he is he's in a good team um you've got to consider that the sort of a, a large proportion of his crashes this year have not been his fault you know there have been other people that have taken him out so on and so forth there's a fair momentum again on now, know it all Twitter or Facebook um, platforms regarding what Sam should do and all the rest of it. Quite cruel. Sam will be aware that he crashes a lot. You know, brother Alex was in the paddock as well at the weekend working for a broadcaster. Um, you know, he's under pressure. You're on. You're constantly under pressure in a Grand Prix paddock, whether you're Moto3, Moto2 or MotoGP. You know, Sam, though, is, is old enough now to be able to deal with that pressure or should be old enough to be able to deal with that pressure. He'll be aware of whatever the mistake. I, I don't recall seeing what the mistake was um, at the weekend. So I, I didn't see the footage regarding that. I'd look for it, but it, I don't think they covered it in the race. And I certainly didn't see anything after that. Um, so I don't know what the exact reasoning was behind um, Sam's crash. But I think he was on his own. So this one is down to him and he'll be kicking himself. You know, where should he go? Yeah, there's always the option to go World Superbike or World Super Sport, maybe. You know, World Super Sport, he'll need to take money with him. You know, he won't get hired there. To, he won't be paid. World Superbike, there's a few talented riders in World Superbike at the moment. I don't know whether there's that many seats that are, that are you know, fantastic factory seats that he would be interested in. So uh, in answer to the question, I think um, as long as Mark VDS, Mark van der Stratton um, still wants Sam in his team, he'll stay there. Well, certainly uh, we'll keep that one. Pete, what do you think? I was just going to say, and another rider that may be kicking themselves on Sunday, Kanet, losing out on that first win yet again, just a few corners to go. You know, I, I don't, it was something like nine times in second place now or something. I mean, he's another, he's a guy that just needs that first win, isn't he? I know we say that about so many, but we've had a season of so many first time winners, and it's almost like the obvious guys are not among mm. them, or some of the obvious guys. So, yeah, I think. Connect, you could see he was pretty uh, okay. Not not Alicia Spargo disappointed, but he was that second place didn't mean much to him. I mean, he needs to make that breakthrough. I mean, he's a guy we we're talking about. Could someone go up to MotoGP next year? Connect is one of the guys that you might say, you know, should be in contention, but he's got to start winning. It's like you read my mind. Mark has asked that exact same question and I was just about to pitch it to you. Is Aaron Connett ready to go up to MotoGP? Well, there's your answer. Um, if he gets that breakthrough win. I, I think to go to MotoGP, yeah, you need at least you know one or two wins under your belt, I think. I, yeah, personally, I think I think if you can do that, you don't have, as Quattro did. I mean, he's, he's kind of the marker now, isn't he, for, for guys of this, let's say, latest generation of Moto2 stars. You don't have to dominate the championship. Quattro has proven that. But you have to show that you're capable. I mean, okay, Quattro officially has one win in Moto Two, but we all know really he won two. The other one was taken away for a tire pressure, a minuscule amount. So yeah, you need to show that that on your day you can win races, and it's not just you know a freak thing with the weather or something like that. You know, you can you can win at least two races. Mm. Yeah, I think if you can do that, I think teams will take you seriously. And team management taking other things as well, don't they? Temperament, character, and how you are reading the situation as well. How you're your technical knowledge is. So there, there are so many other elements to it when you go to MotoGP. And they spotted it in Quattararo. So maybe Canet will be the next one that makes that move with um, very few wins under his belt. We'll have to see at the end of the 
the contractual period next time around. I don't think it'll go this year. I can't see that happening this year at all. Um, And everyone will be on Mm. two-year deals by the end of this year. So um, you might have to wait in line. Moto3, Isan Guevara was able to take advantage of hitting the front, managing his pace, and then able to pull away and win the Moto3 Catalan Grand Prix. It was a Early exit, wasn't it, Pete, for, for Dennis Foggia? Uh, we spoke about it. You mentioned it. The rookie, uh, David Munoz, uh, unbelievable podium he ended up claiming. Uh, and third for Tatsuki Suzuki, Moto3, who are providing the entertainment as always. Yeah, I mean, a, a massive blow for Foggia. A, a double blow, isn't it? After after his home race, you know, the mistake, was it a tear-off? I don't know, but he, he fell off while leading. And then this time it sounds like it was a chain, which, <laughs> I mean... The chains are put through an awful lot of pressure, aren't they? An awful lot of stress on these bikes. If they're too loose, they might pop off. If they're too tight, they might break. On this occasion, it's obviously finished his race, and that's that. And what is it? Is it 55 points, I think? I mean, this is the guy who came in as the preseason favourite. It's a bit of a Banyaya situation, really, for him, isn't it? That, uh, you know, he's now finding himself really on the back foot, and all of these guys are just charging forwards in front of him, and, and he can't just, he just can't get a break at the moment. So, yeah, Gravara and, and, and Munoz, I mean, I don't know what the rules are. Obviously, this was his second race. I don't know what the rules are with the age limit. Can he, you know, can he come in next year? Because obviously, he won't be 18, having competed in this season. Uh, it's something that we'll have to look at in more detail. I'm not sure if, if you know, Keith, on that one, you know, if someone comes in as, you know, and does a few races. Is that enough to then qualify for them next year? Well, he was he was always entered as a full time rider. It was only the fact that he was fifteen, not sixteen. Ah, okay. So I think he was he was he was scheduled, slated as a full time team rider. So right. he hasn't yeah. come in as a wild card. He hasn't come in as a substitute. He was the full time rider. Um, and of course, as soon as he turned sixteen, that's why he's only done two races this year. Um, he's in. So my so understanding right. is. Yeah. He's in, well, you know, like, you know, so the, the, and it comes back to what I said, he's got a leg up over all them 18 year olds that are going to be coming in. Uh, you know, anybody who wants to come into Moto3 from, or anywhere from now on in has got to be 18 plus. That's going to be a big boost, isn't it? You think the still the right decision, by the way, the, I'm not, I'm not criticizing that decision. I think 18 is right. You are mentally developed just that little bit more. You know, there are a lot of things in your life that you should be, um, uh, dealing with, I believe, uh, as a kid and as a parent, um, and force, and there's lots of other opportunities to be riding motorbikes without the kind of pressure that there is when you get to a Grand Prix. Grand Prix is an enormous amount of pressure. Uh, you're talking about the premier classes in in motorcycle racing, so you know taking the pressure off kids is is a, is a good idea. The um, mechanical failure that took Dennis Foger out, Pete. Um, rare rare actually for a, for an actual sort of bike failure for for him is 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 that the title hopes fading if not gone too early to say it's not been a good season as i say yeah he's he's going to need something to start going his way isn't he the trouble with motor 3 is you've got so many competitive riders as we saw on sunday so one bad race and suddenly you know you could be pushed off the podium as we saw for dennis in uh, in le mans he came into that race pole position dominating practice didn't finish on the podium. Then he's gone to Mugello, leading the race. He's fallen off. Now he's had the technical problem. It's it's it, it's it, it's almost the punishment increases when you've got a more competitive field like Moto Three, because you you can't just assume, oh well, I'll win the next three then, and, and at that rate I will make up the difference. He can't assume that. I mean, every it's a fight just to get on the podium. So it's not over. In some ways, it might work for him if a lot of other riders keep squabbling away and taking points away. That's what he needs, really. But you don't want your title destiny to be reliant on other riders, do you? And it, it's starting, as with Banyai, it's starting to look a bit that way for Foggia, that he's going to need some bad finishes for the guys at the top. In some respect, I think it takes the pressure off. I think the fact is that he's just got to do it. I mean, you only do it for yourself anyway. You are only you only focus on your own performance and your own situation. But you've not really got to worry about the points in this situation now. Now it's a case of going out for race wins. Now it's a case of just head down. You're not you're not protecting a position, if you like. Sometimes when you're leading a championship by a few points, you know that's harder. You go a little bit defensive, and that takes the edge off your performance sometimes. So, um, you know, expect a big fight back. We've seen it before with Foggia. We're going to see it again, I reckon. Bring it on in Moto Three. Uh, let's head back up then to Moto GP, shall we? And just round off a few other. 
bits, uh, strong rides uh, from uh, some other riders in the field. Luca Marini, uh, solid sixth place. So we spoke about Vinales again, improved showing, I think, across the weekend in general, still not uh, on Aleish's uh, level. And Alex Marquez from last on the grid up to 10th, uh, powering uh, through. Obviously, his brother, uh, Mark Marquez, uh, ruled out uh, for the time being uh, with that operation, which I think we should say uh, has uh, apparently gone well. The realignment involved making a cut in the humerus and rotating the bone by 30 degrees. That's a lot of degrees. It really is. That's kind of scary operation, really. When you saw the uh, 3D um, model, if you like, of it and what they've got to do to make that work, I mean, it just goes to show you what he was coping with in actual fact. But the operation is bad enough. But for me, it's it's how fast he was coping with something that was 30 degrees out of line. I mean, that's just remarkable. Um, I mean, you've just got to wish him well and hope that he doesn't end up with any infection or any other. That wound was open for two hours longer than ideal. The doctor always, the, the, the surgeon, aims to try and get in, get it done in an hour and get out again. Um, it was a three-hour operation, which meant that that was uh, the wound was open for longer than than ideal. Um, that shouldn't make a lot of difference, obviously, but um, clearly the, uh, the 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 technicalities of it were perhaps a little bit more than what we're giving credit for. It's, how do we how do we just brush this stuff off? <laughs> these uh, these are life-changing operations. These are you know that that man has gone through huge amounts of invasive. I can't, I said it last time we were talking about this, I, I constantly have pain from old injuries when the weather changes, when it gets a bit cooler, whatever it is. And I've had nothing like the injuries that Mark Marquez has had fixed. The fact of the matter is, he must be, I mean, he, you know, he, he has an ant on his helmet, he, you know, he considers an ant to be the toughest, you know, living organism on, on the earth that can move like, God knows how much its own weight, it can endure, you know, pressures that, that most animals can't and that's what he aligns himself to and he truly is one of the toughest people you're ever going to meet to go through what he's gone through recover from what he's recovered from um and you can't deny the fact that you know if this is if this goes right he's going to be back <laughs> watch out everyone 2020 2023 could be a very interesting year again for mark markers <laughs> We still don't know, do we, when he's, he is going to come back. They're being very cautious, which makes sense after all these previous operations and complications. We're hearing it'll be kind of two-week sort of cycles of checks and things like that. But you know, you're already hearing whispers that maybe he'd like to be back for the Mizano test in September. I mean, uh, which is, of course, kind of the first test for the 2023 bikes, isn't it? So that would get him right on track. The test that's going on today in Catalonia, that's really for this year's development, isn't it? But Mizano is when they start to look to next year. So it, it would make sense. So maybe that's, that's we have to see how he recovers. I'm sure we'll see a similar format to before where he'll, he'll practice on maybe a dirt bike and then a street bike and, and things like that. So we'll get plenty of warning of when he is going to come back, whenever that might be. But yeah, that's uh, that, that's possible. So we might, might be looking at somewhere around September. Quick word on that, if I might. It's all very well saying that he's going to come back for a test in 2022, um, but he's not coming back as the same Mark Marquez. The point is, is all the other tests that he's done, he's been at the top of his game, the top of his abilities to recognise exactly what he needs, wants, and how to go about what he's doing on a motorcycle. When he comes back after this operation, he still won't be at the top of his game. He can't be. He'll be ring rusty, if you like. He, he won't. You know, he won't have done enough of that top level riding to know his bike intimately like he has in the past when he's contributed to what he wants from Honda. And that's what worries me in that the bike development might go in a direction that is more generic, that, that you know, he needs something extreme. Mark Marquez works in an extreme way with his bike. And so if the bike is developed in, in a more of a generic manner, it might not suit Mark Marquez. And then by the time we get to 2023 and we're all locked into what we've got to have for next year, um, he might not have the bike that he wants for 2023. It's a serious worry and I'm sure he's across it. I'm sure he'll be more than concerned about how that works. So he'll want to be getting some mileage in on the, the latest bike. But again, you know, testing programs and the like, he just can't, you know, because, you know, Honda don't have concessions. He's not allowed to be out testing on the bike. Um, it's, it's against the rules. So, 
it's all working against him a bit at the moment, Mark Marquez. It's going to be a remarkable comeback in 2023. I've we'll keep all our fingers crossed. It, it was a, it was a good uh, run though from his brother though, P. Alex Marquez, uh, channeling uh, his inner Mark Marquez. He won't like me saying that, would he? Uh, but going from last on the grid to tenth, uh, certainly I think uh, Mark Marquez posting on socials, you know, that really hard to come from the back, as you can imagine. So uh, Sterling effort uh, compared to his teammate uh, and it, well, the other Honda rider, Paul Spargo, felt like a stone. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Alex wasn't even sure he was going to start the race. There was that massive accident in, in qualifying, well, final practice that caused him to miss qualifying, where he, he looked completely shut. You know, he, another visor ripped off the helmet, as would happen to Nakagami the next day. I mean, you know, and he, he looked pretty, pretty sore from that. There was some talk that he might have had a slight concussion. He made clear, no, no, they did the tests on me. I, I was fine. So, you know, all the scans, no, nothing broken. And, and so back he came. But yeah, as you say, no qualifying means starting at the back of the grid. So uh, I think he went for the soft tyre gamble, the Vinales gamble, if you like, and just sort of brought it home. Polis Vargro, just, just zero grip, it seems like. And uh, Bradle crashed out. I mean, it was just a nightmare day for Honda. And, and coming back to what Keith was saying about bike development, Honda still, they only have Mark Marquez signed for next year. So at the moment, they don't have any other riders to, you know that they know are going to be on the bike racing next year with which to try and develop the bike. This is just making things even more complicated for them, isn't it? We saw Nakagami start to get some of Mark Marquez's parts, which Paul wasn't too happy about this weekend. Whether um, you know the other guys are getting them at the test today, we'll have to wait and see what they say at the end of today. But yeah, a really difficult situation for Honda. But for, Mark, for Alex, coming back to your question, yeah, definitely, the, the, as he said, the sort of ride that he needs, it was a great ride, but still, it's not the end result that's going to make him, you know, celebrate at the moment. He's He, he needs better than that, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it still adds that massive great question, you know. Even the suspicion of concussion, why was he on the grid? I'll leave that one hanging out there for the time being. Um, I've got no answers to it. It's just one that just doesn't fit well with a top-line sport for me. If you've had a bang on the head and you're not quite sure about whether you're concussed or not, any doubt should mean that you stay out, in my view. Um, again, that's a an open question to anybody on Crash that wants to get involved in that one from 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 me. You can give me a hard time <laughs> if you fancy it. Um, Mia was my man of the uh, man of the race, I think, from where he came from. Joe and Mia on the Suzuki, um, like Alex Marquez, it was a good ride from Alex Marquez. Whatever the the, the um, head injury situation is concerned, it was a great ride from him. But I think Joe and Mia had a really, really good ride up in the fourth place for Suzuki. He also said, I should just add that he, he might go and buy Alesha a bottle of wine just for that, <laughs> you know, bumping him up one, one more position. <laughs> but no, he did say, he did say, you know, he felt very sorry for, for Alesha and that, you know, he should be proud of his race and his season. And it, I mean, he said he's sure, sure he won't make that mistake again. But it does just send a line, doesn't it? Oh. These guys are out there on their own. Alesha, you know, there's no radios, people shouting in their why? ears like Formula One. So why? They're out there on their own. Sorry, sorry and, if this and, is a, a naive question, but why don't they have team radio surely it's not impossible no no it can be yeah. done but i mean the old ship to shore thing has been discussed a lot in the past and uh definitely but, but why? Out. because of where it well, would I mean, lead uh, yeah as far as you, you'd have people a bit like formula coaching riders they don't they don't want they want the, it to be the rider's decision when they're on the track that's uh, right that well, seems okay. so so they've got the dashboard messages and, that, and that's kind of the compromise isn't it that they, you can have some messages from race direction or, or pre-selected messages from your team, like somebody following, or but not actual specific, you know, ride like this, do like that. And there's, and there's a lot going on. I mean, I, you know, when you hear, I mean, I, I have to smile when I listen to the Formula One guys when they're conversing with their their, their team on the, on the pit wall and it sounds like they're sat at home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unless it's Kimi Raikkonen. Me he, they were my favourite ship to shore messages, Raikkonen. <laughs> when he says, it tells him to shut up now, he's busy or whatever it might be. I, I, but all you would get from a rider is grunts because it's yeah, bloody hard yeah. work. It is like massively physical. And, you know, and you're, you're sticking your helmet in, up into the air in, in, in places. You've got the turbulence you've got on a bike that's, that's more than you would have sat in a, in, a, in a Formula One car, perhaps, or any other car that has ship to shore. But... Uh, so I think that there are some fairly, mm. you know, basic reasons for not having that okay. kind of situation. Okay. Um, and again, but having said that, I can see why you might ask the question when you've got someone who's just missed their last lap board. It seems a bit archaic, doesn't it? A last lap board yeah. hanging out. I, 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 could... 
I used to have I used to have one made that I was on an extender. <laughs> What, so you hit so, it? So it, I used to have the strongest mechanic in the whole pit lane that can hang the thing out so it's stuck out further because I could never see it. I never have good eyesight. See all these boards all the way down pit lane, it's impossible to see. Well, uh, I one one day, one day, Alesh might look back on this and laugh, but oh, I think it's going to be God. a while. You know, you have to you have to ask. You know, if that had happened to another rider, would everyone have been so? not forgiving but you know everyone loves a leash don't they and it's all oh god we're so upset for you but it, you wonder if it'd been another rider you know whether it'd been a bit like oh come on what an idiot you know like that a basic mistake a motor gp rider shouldn't be making i'll leave that one there because we are running out of time no no i think i think if i'd been the pramac team i'd have been yeah. jumping up and down <laughs> somewhat distastefully or even joe yeah, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. like despite the fact despite uh, the facade all being very concerned <laughs> nah um, a quick word as well, just to say, uh, Remy Gardner achieved his best ever results uh, in MotoGP with 11th, uh, and uh, Ralph Fernandez scored his first points as well, a bit further down. But Tech Three, with their struggles at the moment, uh, leads me nicely on to end with some listener questions. Uh, and one about KTM. We spoke very briefly about it just at the start, about Jack Miller. It's pretty much expected he's going to go to KTM. Dylan asks, what will Jack Miller be able to do with the KTM that the others can't? Jack Miller's a great rider. And I think Jack Miller and Brad Binder, you know, two great riders with um, with that kind of Antipodean attitude and that South African attitude. They are going to be a tough couple, that's for certain. be interesting to see how they drag that KTM around next year. Yeah, you know, I think Jack Miller's going to motivate the team. I think that's the important part of the situation that they're in at the moment. They will be testing with stuff later this year. They're not that far away. Brad Binder had a good ride again at the weekend. Um, and it is sometimes just that degree of extra motivation. It's just that degree of extra belief. You know, Aprilia have now got it, whereas up until just a few months ago, they didn't have it. You know, suddenly it's, it's appearing in actual results and everybody wants to be on an Aprilia now. It's it's remarkable how things can change, and I and I get the feeling that KTM will go the same way. I think Jack Miller's a good signing; he'll work well with that team. It's going to be a, you know, you've got a couple of really really tough runners there. Great for Remy to see him back on on that kind of form, scoring points again. Lovely bloke, and and likewise the the Tech Three team, you know, Guy Coulon, Hervé Pancherel, they are old school, great team, long, you know, standing in the paddock. Everyone will wish them well. Um, maybe 2023 is going to be the year where we're going to see KTM back on it. Sounds like Oliveira might be going towards a, a Ducati ride next year, just just to pick up on that. Um, maybe Grassini, maybe you know Bastianini moving up. That would create that space. If you like, Miller moves on, Bastianini moves up, and Oliveira might move over to there. Might suit him. You know, it, you could be sure that the, the GG likes to have a range of riders, doesn't he? Uh, and and Oliveira is a thinker. He's a clever guy. He's a fully qualified dentist. I think we brought up here before. You know, and, and he's the kind of guy that you can imagine GG would 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 like to have that kind of feedback from someone like that on his bike. And uh, there's a lot of bikes that they've got to make available, isn't there? So yeah, so you can kind of see that 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 could fit together. Um, proven multiple race winner, but it's just not happening with the KTM this year in the dry for Oliveira, is it? But, uh, you know, testing parts today, let's see if they can make a breakthrough. It's tough times for all of, all of them. Uh, as Keith says, Brad Binder's grabbing it by the scruff of the neck and uh, and sort of drawing results out of that bike. But I think they know that, that they've got to make more of a step with it. And uncertain futures, really, for, for, well, for everyone. I don't think there's any satellite team riders that are actually officially confirmed for next year yet. Um, obviously, Luca Marini will be staying. I can't imagine his brother <laughs> giving him the nudge. So we can say that's safe. But 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 really, all of the other seats, there's, there's no one signed. We've had a lot of deals coming out, let's say, lately, but they've all been for factory rides. So there's a lot of uncertainty over the independent team lineups for next year. You, you know, Darren Binder, Remy Gardner, let's hope that, uh, you know, with the performances they're doing, Darren again finishing ahead of Morbidelli. I mean, that's another strong performance for him. So, and as you say, Remy's best race. So, I mean, those guys are, they're doing what they can to, to prove that they that they should be there, you know, next year. But as we say, less bikes on the grid, you know, someone's going to have to make room. So final, final time. question, or, or just on that, Pete, from Craig Pote, uh, do we know if Morbidelli has a performance clause in his contract? Because we've spoken about this. Surely Yamaha can't be impressed. Should they rather take a punt on Darren Binder for the Factory 2023 team? <laughs> right, for, 
let's consider also that Morbidelli is a VR46 rider. His management, he's managed by VR46, who run Yamaha's Moto2 team, who have all these close links with Yamaha. Now, are Yamaha really going to boot out somebody? And, and call, you know, I can't see it. The only way that I can see, Morbidelli has a contract for next year. The only way I can see that they that they he wouldn't stay in the factory team would be, as you say, a third bike. Is that likely? The rules say, in principle, each team must be two riders, and that's to cover both for one rider teams. And then we saw the Repsol Honda example back with Stone Adovi and Pedroza as as the example of the three rider teams. But in principle, they only want two. I mean, with everything that's going on, it seems unlikely to me. I mean, we've we've heard Lynn Jarvis almost confirm there's no room for top rack. So that being the case, replacing Morbidelli, I, I just can't say. I think the only way that, that that could happen is if Morbidelli had a better offer somewhere else or, or just made it his decision. But I think, you know, it's a factory contract. People want to be factory riders. He's worked hard to get to where he is. He's beaten Quattararo in the past. You know, their first two years together at Patronus, he was a close match for him. Finished second in the championship that, that year in 2020. So, uh, it'd be a big call, as I say, all things considered. I understand why people are saying that. And, and as far as performance clauses, I mean, you never know exactly what's in a MotoGP contract. There's always options and clauses and everything else. But as we've seen, there's, there's ways out of contracts, isn't there? You know, we've seen with Vinales last year and everything else. So uh, I think with everything that's going on, they've got Quattararo in place. They don't want to rock the boat and call, you know, they've lost their satellite team. I, I, I think... We have to see how the rest of the year goes, but I think Morbidelli will stay where he is. All right, then. Well, we'll leave it there. That was a packed show, gents. Thank you. And thank you for sending in your questions and for watching and and listening as well. Make sure you stay tuned in across Crash.net for all the latest news and analysis across the week as well. We've got the Catalan test ongoing, so uh, keep an eye on Crash.net for all the very latest as and when that happens. And we shall be uh, back with you as ever, this time next week. Get your questions in, leave them in the comments section, tweet, Instagram or Facebook us, just search Crash Moto GP. Keith can't do that because he's deleted Facebook. Uh, but you can leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts as well. And we shall see you right back here next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>